thank you very much uh, that I can be here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for, very much for introducing me. Um, so as you already said, my name is Stefan Humpel. I'm uh, CEO of 3S Unternehmensberatung and 3S Research Lab. So we have two uh, connected uh, companies. One is more research-based, the other one is uh, more consultancy-based. Um, so uh, what I can tell you a little bit about, uh, so this is the, the research strands uh, that we do. We, we, we do a lot of national qualification frameworks and European qualification frameworks. Uh, we are involved in, uh, in commission consultancy to the European uh, qualification framework and we are also involved in ministerial consultancy for the national qualification framework and it's a hell of a project. It will take... Only one question. Vocational education yes. is a formación Sorry. profesional. Yeah, yes. Because sometimes yes. we don't know the, the, the real translation. Okay. Yes. Sorry, okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, yes, the, the EQF is a hell of a project. It started about 15 years ago. And in my opinion, it will take another 50 years or so. <laughs> they wanted to have it ready by 2010. And now you know it's 2015. And uh, I think it's not ready. <laughs> Uh, it's also about ECVET. Uh, ECVET is, as you said, f especially for the vocational education and training, uh, so formación profesional. Yes. Uh, and it's uh, something like uh, you know in higher education as ECTS. Uh, that's the, the, the trial to have something similar for the vocational education and training. So it's a credit transfer system for vocational credits. Um, we are also working on the validation of informal and non-formal uh, learning uh, and we are part of the observal network uh, which is uh, uh, dealing with that uh, and we are also a member of the ReferNet in Austria which is uh, working together with SEREFOP uh, which is the European Centre for Formación Profesional. Yes, okay. Good. I'm improving my Spanish here. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And, of course, uh, we've been in uh, work-based learning quite much. Um, and uh, as Reina already introduced me, we do know a little bit about the um, well, relationship between universities or higher education and companies because we did very, very, very many feasibility studies because that had been uh, a legal uh, prediction, or illegal, sorry, it's not pre precondition uh, for the accreditation of uh, university courses in Austria in the universities of applied sciences. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, have been involved uh, so largely in that. Um, yes, and so we did a lot of labor market and credit surveys, so uh, on a national basis. Uh, we did also do some analysis of qualification needs and development of strategies for regions, uh, for branches, sectors, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, uh, of course, we are also involved in quality assurance and development, especially for universities for applied sciences. And I come back to the universities of the applied sciences in a minute. Um, we also work together with Reina and other partners you uh, might have... Uh, Learn to know uh, Tauno and uh, Jane uh, mm -hmm. already in uh, a pro uh, Erasmus project that was called Wiblik, Work-Based Learning as Integrated Curriculum. And I think the four of us had more or less been the core group working uh, on the project. Um, and we tried to provide some insights into the development of work-based learning in Europe, uh, especially of work-based learning in higher education because that's the focus point of the project itself because, uh, well, we have some very traditional systems of work-based learning in Formación Profesional in Austria or Germany uh, and this was not about apprenticeship. This was about uh, uh, work-based learning in higher education. Um, and so the case study I will present today about uh, the University of Applied Sciences in Wels, which is in Upper Austria, uh, was one of the case studies for that project. Okay, doesn't work like that. Let's do it like that. Okay, um, 
Before I, uh, I present something about uh, VELS, the case study I'm going to present, I have to talk a little bit about the uh, system of universities of applied sciences in Austria. Um, it was about 20 years ago now, so 1994, 1995, the first courses uh, in universities of applied sciences had been established. And there was the legal framework established in 1993, I think. Uh, so it was very late compared to other countries. Uh, I think in the UK it was in the 60s that this new kind of universities emerged. In Germany it was in the early 70s. Uh, in Austria, it was in the 90s, and everybody said, well, why in the 90s? Why so late? But on the other hand, the pressure, why the legal system was established in the 90s was so high, especially from employer's side, because they said, we are not satisfied with the graduates from the traditional university system. They are very good in their disciplines, but they have no applied skills. And that's a huge problem uh, that was uh, said in Austria, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, when the transition from the heavy industry into intelligent industry took place. Um, so it was the Universities of Applied Sciences in Austria had been designed as a labor market oriented higher education system. So they were obliged to talk to the labor market and to communicate to the labor market and to pr provide courses which fulfill labor market needs. Whatever that means, that's a different story. But there was, in the, in the legal system, it was uh, connected that there is a labor market oriented higher education system. Um, the, the law itself, I would say, was very modern and very efficient. The law itself has 12 pages which is ridiculous compared to any other higher education law I know. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, there was an accreditation body which was uh, founded to accredit uh, the new courses and the new institutions. And the rules of engagement from that accreditation body was quite big. <laughs> so. Uh, so since the 90s, we have now 15 new universities of applied sciences uh, in Austria, most of them established in the very first years. Uh, some of them wanted to be new universities, but they were forced to connect to other new universities because somebody said, oh, well, the, the number of universities for a country like Austria, eight and a half million people right now, uh, we have a lot of universities already. So. Um, there is another thing that I uh, wanted to say here. Yes, in the, in the mid-90s, the time when those 50 new institutions emerged, it was kind of a gold rush. So there had been a lot of money, public money, spent into the universities of applied sciences, which, of course, uh, created some critical eye from the traditional universities, because they said, they are spending our money to them which wasn't true, they had the same amount of money as before, but they thought it could be money that we could get. <laughs> so there was, of course, some, some very critical uh, issues. Uh, and they had a very critical eye, especially on the quality of the University of Applied Sciences, because they said, OK, they are very applied, fine. They are very professional oriented, fine. They are vocational oriented, probably. Fine, but where's the higher education in it? What's, what's, what's the university aspect? Is there really reflection? Is there really critical thinking? Is there really theoretical aspects uh, integrated somehow? And so uh, the accreditation body of the University of Applied Sciences, please, come on. <laughs> Hi. Uh, the accreditation body uh, really took care about that. So they in their quality uh, monitoring, they really took care that the higher education aspect was fulfilled somehow. So, and I think uh, most of the big uh, discussion issues from the mid-90s are vanished now. Many 
universities of applied sciences do cooperate with traditional universities and vice versa. So there have been tensions, uh, but with the years and the high quality management from the accreditation body, uh, the tension uh, vanished somehow. Of course, if you talk about courses with uh, low student numbers uh, competing for the same target group, it is still a problem, of course. Uh, and another thing uh, which is not mentioned here on the slide is uh, that uh, the new universities for applied sciences should address also new student groups. Because um, we found out that the traditional universities addressed a very specific group of students. Uh, they couldn't address people interesting in upskilling because the very theoretical and discipline-oriented approach at the traditional universities didn't focus on that. So they, they just weren't interested and they said they should go to any further education or whatever. But the further education was also not ready to do that because they, the further education institutions were ready to do very broad courses short term. but. Uh, especially in, in, in that time, there was uh, a, a lot of need for upskilling of uh, upper secondary graduates from technical vocational schools who entered the labor market and after two, three, four, five years, they found out, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm standing on a level but I can't get any further. And so they had the need uh, to, to go back to any uh, upskilling institution and there was none. So, the universities of applied science took over. Uh, and therefore, we have very specific uh, forms of studying at the universities of applied sciences. About 65% uh, are very traditional forms. So people after secondary school enter the University of Applied Science, uh, be there full time in full time studies. But about 35% of the students are part time students. So they are studying parallel to any professional career they are taking. Uh, they are studying after they have entered the job market three to five years ago, some of them even 15 years ago. So it was really that there was a competition also between universities of applied science and further education. Uh, yes, so that's also another important point. Okay, then I come to the, to the specific case that I want to talk about. So this is Austria, very small, about eight and a half million inhabitants. And the very small blue point over here, this is Wels. Wels is a very small city in Upper Austria, and Upper Austria is a industrial region. Uh, in Upper Austria, the big uh, heavy industry was located until the 80s in Austria and Upper Austria uh, managed to turn from heavy industry into a uh, very modern uh, industry uh, like uh, yeah, automotive engineering, IT, healthcare and stuff like that. Um, and so it is still a very industrial region it is the industrial region of Austria, I could say, uh, and uh, most of the workplaces are in industry and uh, related to industry. Um, the course MEVI, uh, it's MEVI stands for Mechatronics and Wirt Mechatronic Wirtschaft, which is in English Mechatronics and Management. Uh, the course MEVI was first designed in 1998. Um, as I said, in Wels, and the course was designed in the, in, in the 90s specifically to one and only target group, to people who had been uh, going through technical school on higher education, ba uh, higher secondary basis, sorry. So only graduates from technical vocational schools had been allowed to admit that course. And only those 
where the technical vocational school said something about machinery, mechatronics, engineering, IT. So construction was not allowed. It was a different thing. Okay? So they had really uh, one specific target group. Now it has changed. Now they opened up and they have the first year uh, as a bridge year for those br not bringing uh, the skills from that specific school with them. Now it has changed. Uh, and uh, the course was designed to combine relevant knowledge uh, in mechatronics, uh, mechatronics engineering, with management aspects. Because um, that was part of the upskilling scheme. Um, most technicians from the technical vocational schools, they had quite good jobs in industry. They entered, they had uh, quite good experiences. And then they found out after three to five years, I have no skills in leadership, no skills in management, no skills in project management, no skills in globalization and how to communicate with people in China. And so they said, that's what I really need. But they didn't want to take up a management course because that was way too far from where they came from. So that was part of the game here. It's still a very technical uh, course, but it has a lot of management aspects in it. And the technical aspects was, were, were, I think, also interesting for the employers, because the employers said, OK, they bring in new innovative uh, technical methodologies and knowledge. Um, In the case study, we tried to find out what was the market need, which was quite easy in Austria to find out. It was differently in other countries. Um, it was easy in Austria because, as I said at the beginning, uh, the accreditation body for universities of applied sciences said, you have to make a feasibility study to show the market need of your study program. So if you don't show it, you'd never get an accreditation. So. Um, the study program, um, Mechatronics and Management, was designed and further developed in communication with the regional labor market. How is that done? Uh, by regulation from the accreditation body, they had to uh, found development teams. And each development team had to consist of at least two people from the academic staff and at least two employers. So this development team worked together on the curriculum development. Of course, the curriculum itself was de developed by the academic staff, but they had to talk a lot with the employers. And the employers had been very much interested. So there was uh, um, the, 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 the regional uh, industry was very much in, uh, interested in getting involved because they saw well, we have a lack of qualified people. And what can we do to overcome that lack? Uh, it was also high accepted by the students, which means there had been much more students applying uh, for this study program than there had been places, which was also new for Austria. In traditional universities, until the 90s, or until m mostly now, uh, you have as much students as are applying. They just come, and then they're here. In universities for applied sciences, you get a financing per capita, per student, which means you get a, uh, uh, th this course had at first 60 study places per year. So they could take up 60 students. And they had about 150 uh, applicants, so they ha had to choose. They had to select somehow. And um, you can say, well, it, th th there are questions of fairness in selection and whatever, of course, yeah. But selecting students was one of the success factors also, and is still one of the success factors in the universities of applied sciences. Um, there is a still, still, even though the crisis hit Austria too, 
but not as hard as Spain, of course. But still, there is a high demand for technical college graduates from the employers because they are very good skilled, they have very good competences, vocational and professional competences, uh, and they are somehow cheap because they are somehow young. Yes? Um, this is a crucial group in Austria for the industry development, I would say. And it's not only in Austria, it's also the same in Switzerland. It's a little bit different in Germany, but it's comparable in the Czech Republic. So th there are some of these technical colleges uh, which are really crucial. But as I already said, those upskilling schemes were missing uh, at the beginning from uh, in the 90s. And from the 90s on, the universities of applied sciences took over those upskilling schemes. And another interesting finding um, for the whole sector, and which is true also for that one, for that course, is so-called non-traditional students, students who uh, took their uh, university uh, entrance graduates, graduation uh, parallel to a job because they didn't fa finish school at first hand. They have lower dropout rates than traditional students because they usually know what they really want. <laughs> they have gone a long way to come there and they know what they really want. So they are very interesting for the, for the different courses. Okay, as I already said, for the curriculum design, um, you were obliged to have a development team consisting of at least two academics and two uh, employers. Usually the, the, the curriculum design groups are much bigger and the communication between employers and academic staff is an ongoing process in, in courses like uh, mechatronics and management. Um, and um, yes, you had also to make some balancing between the different uh, demands from different employers, which is always you, the course is not designed for one employer. It's designed for a whole sector, I would say. Uh, and it goes from automotive engineering over to uh, traditional machinery to uh, healthcare uh, produ production and, and stuff like that. Yes. Um, they had to take into account different analysis, like a feasibility study uh, that was done uh, in the mid-90s, and uh, especially through the uh, concept of being a part-time study, there was a high communication between employers, students, and the academic staff. Because the students, uh, they had very specific demands, because they couldn't attend classes during daytime, so you had to design the whole course around evening and weekend classes. And of course, uh, I come later to those uh, pro, uh, uh, module overarching projects. Uh, they had to fulfill projects while studying, and the projects usually came from the employers because they had a specific interest, they had a specific need, and they said, okay, you are studying, why, why, why don't you make your master thesis to that topic or whatever, make a project about it, and ask other people. And that was very important for the course also. Um, Yes, that's more or less the most important on that. Yes, uh, as I said, the curriculum design itself was, was carried out by academic staff, but they had to take into account what the employers said. Um, they were following the basic uh, technological and economic development lines in the field of industrial uh, mechatronics. What does that mean? In the mid-90s, uh, IT was growing, growing, growing. So they had to put a lot of IT into uh, the, the curriculum, uh, especially everything programming directly on machines. I, I don't know the real word for that, sorry. <laughs> there, is, there are specific words for that. Uh, and 
the, the basic economic uh, lines was they needed much more management skills, they needed international skills because the industry grew global in the mid-90s. And so you had those basic development lines. Mechatronics, uh, mechatronics and management was, was, was following them. The still significant challenge is that the uh, study program wants to ensure that it remains at the cutting edge of technological development as well as uh, social and economic changes. So economic pressure now says it's, it's not only management, it's also other things that are interesting, especially team leading, which are much more interesting now than probably 15 years ago. 15 years ago it was important, but now it's, it's even more important. Uh, and also seeing innovative uh, technologies uh, and uh, that there is always a tension on that. Uh, as a study program, you cannot be ahead of the uh, cutting edge. The cutting edge usually comes from uh, the economy. But, so you always are a little bit behind. But on the other way, economy is trying to get people who are ahead of them. So there is a lot of communication going on on what's really needed and, and, and in, what, in what direction will the econom economy go in the next five years. And if you talk to uh, employers, usually they say, I don't know about the next five years, I, I want to survive the next year. And so it's, it's really a hard thing. So those, those structures, are, to maintain those communication structures is, is really not easy. Um, but they do a lot on it, and I can tell you a little bit about it later on. Um, OK, how is the study program delivered? So as I said, it's a career parallel program, part-time study program. The Austrian law for universities of applied sciences is strange in that point because they say it's somewhere it's, it's not really written in the law but it was in the in the accreditation body's full paper you know uh, and they said something like uh, the expected amount of time invested in studying for a full-time student should be around 1600 hours per year which is somehow comparable to nearly a full-time job OK, now we have people with a full-time job, and they are investing at least 1,600 hours per year in their full-time job. And now they step out of their full-time job and should have the same quality of education in a very little time. And so everything, everybody thought, OK, they, they will get more time, more, more length. So if, if the others have three years, it would be good to have five or six years. No, it was not allowed. The same length. And because the accreditation body said they are learning at the workplace. So you have to find something how to integrate that learning at the workplace into the University of Applied Science. And that's a very tricky thing because Learning at the workplace is very individual, is often informal, non-formal, takes place in several occasions which are not structured anyway. And how to get them, how to grab them and integrate them into a curriculum, that was really the hard thing. And I, I, I think every course in University of Applied Science which is career parallel, is still struggling with that. So th this problem is not solved anyhow. But of course, each course found some regulations to do that. Um, so the regulation they found here is that they said, it is a basic requirement that the students have somehow the same uh, set of 
prior learning, of prior competences which they bring in. So they do respect their students as experts. Those students have expertise which is connected to their company, which is usually higher than the expertise of the teaching staff in that area. So uh, there is a, 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 a company called Rosenbauer. They built uh, um, uh, fire brigade cars, so the big, huge lorries with the hoses <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, so if it comes to uh, the specific uh, diesel pumps which are connected to those fire brigade car cars, the students from Rosenbauer, they know more about it than everybody else because they are working on that every day. And if some other student had a problem which was connected to, to a, a diesel pump, they went to the other students. And uh, so that was the thing, how, how they found out that we need some, something which is called overarching, subject overarching projects. And those subject overarching projects are the problem-based part of learning in the curriculum. And they are embedded into the curriculum and they try to provide a maximum of flexibility within the borders of mechatronics and management. Students are project managers in those overarching uh, projects. And they arrange student groups of three or four students um, based on their different knowledge and expertise. And usually, or occasionally, uh, the projects last longer than one semester. And the problem definition is based on real industrial problems provided by employers. So, and this can only work if you secure that all students are able to bring in such problems for problem-based learning. And that has to do, again, with the uh, application to studying, that during the application process, it is screened if the employer really fits and the student really fits because he, should, he or she should be able to bring in such problems. And that's a very, very tricky thing. Um, of course, we have, we have other things which are uh, more well known, like lectures pr plus practical exercises combined in modules. And uh, we have, of course, uh, which is also very common diploma thesis, which are based on uh, real industrial problems. But I think the core is really in here. So this pillar for the curriculum is very, very important and is also the tricky thing to fulfill because the projects always change and you always have new projects. You never can say this student group is doing that the one before. It's, it, it's never the same. It's always different and it's really challenging for the whole staff. Yes, uh, so a little bit more about the overarching projects and, and what kind of flexibility they really provide. Um, Yes, that's, that's one thing. Some of the projects can be created in a way that they build on previous projects. So they, they, they probably last through the whole uh, time of the study program. OK. I think I said most of that <laughs> with the slide before. Sorry. <laughs> What does it mean for the organization of the course program? Um, within the University of Applied Science, the course pro study program MEVI, Mechatronics and Management, Ooh. is very specific. It's not the only one which is career parallel, but it's the only one with a specific industrial focus. 
Others are focused on social uh, services, healthcare. This one is really industrial focused. And the application process where they accept the students as experts uh, led to something that I would say the, the whole University of Applied Science in Upper Austria, in, in Wales, um, is seeing those students as a very specific groups with very specific needs and they are accepting them really with their needs. So they, are, they, are, they, are, they are treating them different to other students, which is also not easy, of course, because other students say, why are they treated better? <laughs> and that's a very tricky thing, I think. But still, um, the, all, the lex all, all the academic stuff gives them uh, a very flexible uh, communication structure. So they, they, they try to fulfill an open door policy. If you come, if you have any problem, you always come to me. And I talk to the, to the uh, study program leader uh, for a very long time, and he said he, he's, he's not, he's the manager for the academic stuff, but he's the coach for his students. Because mostly the students come in and have some other problem, which is not connected to the study program at all. Because they say, uh, I'm now three years never at home, and my wife wants a divorce. How can we solve that? And so it's a lot of personal problems coming up. Uh, so he took up uh, a more of a mentoring and coaching role for his students. And uh, this is probably one of the success factors there. Because the, the, the academic and uh, is discussed with the academic stuff, but they needed somebody to discuss their personal problems because of that career parallel study program. And the time is the biggest issue there. And so they tried to, to find something with that. So uh, what, what did the course leader do? He, he opened up uh, the courses he, uh, for, for, for the uh, spouses and wives and husbands for his students. So he said, well, they are always invited to come. Maybe we find something uh, which is interesting for them and their career, because most of them also are involved in any career. So he was broadening up a little bit and, 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 and inviting and making open days and even for children and stuff like that. It's, it, it, it is a lot of work, of course. Uh, but he had to do something like that to reflect on that, on those huge personal problems connected with the lack of time. Um, yes, as far as it looks, uh, the students seem to be very satisfied with the course because the course has a very low dropout rate, even compared to other uh, career parallel courses. Um, and they, we, we had several uh, interviews with students for the case study also. They feel really accepted as experts. And so their expertise is highly esteemed uh, in the course. And that's very, very important for them. Um, of course, there are several uh, evaluation um, structures established. Um, Yes, and I also took some before, like the last one. Uh, of course, the course has very well established feedback structures, and the feedback structure is not only about uh, single lessons. Uh, the problem is uh, in Austria, in, in the higher education system, um, you are obliged to get feedback to every single lesson, to every single course. And at the end of the year, or at the end of the term, you usually provide a questionnaire to your students. Have you been satisfied with what I did this term with you? And usually, you get 10% of the questionnaires back because students are really sick of filling them. So much paper, always the same. And if I fill in what I was not liking, 
no, nothing happens with it. So what should I do it for? And so they broke out of that, and they had uh, specific evaluation days where they really set together the whole academic staff with all the students sitting together. The groups are not as big. Yeah? 60 students, OK, yeah, that's quite much. But if you divide them and have time for a whole day, you can go module-wise or something like, that, something like that. And they do it like that. So they really talk to each other. Uh, and, and talk about the problems they have with each other, probably. Uh, and they feel accepted in that way, too, because then the academic staff has to change something if I say I do something about that problem. If I just get back 10% of questionnaires and two questionnaires say, you have been doing this and that and that in the wrong way, I say, OK, but the rest of it accepted, fine. And I think it's, 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 it's quite a good way. And um, in Austria, like I think everywhere in Europe, um, a, a ranking mania came up. <laughs> so uh, you can always discuss about the methodology of ranking. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it well done? Is it? Oh, didn't say that. Uh, but the course Mechatronics and management in each ranking is very, very high ranked. So they are proud of it, and I understand that. So maybe that's also another uh, point to mention here. OK, to come to an end, I, I, I have two slides with uh, success factors and critical issues to sum up. And if it comes to the success factors, uh, it's even more success factors than critical issues. but. Of course, you could raise more critical issues. OK. Um, OK. One of the success factors is that the study program could establish itself as a brand in the region. Maybe if you come to Upper Austria and talk about maybe in, the, in, in an industry company, they all know about it. And usually, it's the other way around. The, the, the employers know about the institutions where their graduates come from. But they don't know which really courses or study programs they have attended there. It's, well, we have a huge mess of different study programs in universities of applied sciences. Maybe is a brand. They know about it. Um, another success factor is that there is really high flexibility uh, within the study program concerning delivery and content through the different feedback structures they established. And there is also a high willingness of all lecturers and the whole academic staff uh, to accept the expert status of the students. There's also a high flexibility in organization, in curriculum design and delivery, especially with, with those overarching projects, which are one of the, the basic pillars for the whole uh, study program. Um, Another success factor is seeing the specific target group and uh, creating a, a, a group of students with, who have probably nearly the same competences. Not the same, but in the same way, you know? Not, not the, the, so it's, it's not really an unstructured group, to say that. And uh, they try to provide a lot of additional learning support, uh, especially for students who had been out of school for a long time. Because with those uh, career parallel uh, uh, approach, they have students, they come back to school or to university in that way after 10 or 15 years. And they really forgot a lot of things in mathematics, in engineering. So they needed some specific support to get them on board again with that. Yes, I would say the, the communication between employers, learners, and the university itself is, is very fruitful. So they, 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 they could act it up as a very good communication basis. So, and the, the students themselves usually, they act as intermediaries between what employers need and what the university can do. 
Okay, of course, critical issues, the limited time. That's the most critical issue. The students say that, the academic staff says that, the employers say that because students are away on weekends and on evenings, especially when there's a rush or whatever. So uh, for everybody, the limited time is one of the big issues and they, you ha they, they have to find organizational uh, coverage for that limit limited time. And um, of course, if we talk about high flexibility in delivery of a curriculum, this is a critical issue itself. Because of course, if you say this is a discipline, this is a curriculum, this is connected to a discipline, um, it's fine. But if you want to stay at the cutting edge of uh, the technological development, you always have to redo your curriculum. You always have to rethink it. Is it done in the right way? Is the right content connected to it? And so this is a high pressure issue for the, for the University of Applied Science. Okay, so I, I, I'll just leave that here. This was one of the, uh, whatever, placard? I don't know, don't know the English name for it. We, we had mini conferences in, okay. in Prague and Vienna, and this was in the, in the back, one of the big, big posters, posters, yes, thank you. I miss, missed the word posters, sorry. Uh, yes, and I'll just leave it here. Okay, so thank you very much.